practice of the Dharma is often compared to being a warrior, doing battle with your defilements. And it's important to have a realistic view of what it means to be a warrior. The romantic view sees the warrior as someone who's always strong, always ready to take on the enemy, no matter what, no matter where, no matter when. But that's not a very realistic view of how warriors operate. Warriors have to choose their battles. And they also have to know their own strength. If they're wounded, they have to know that they've got to escape to some place where they can rest, recuperate, deal with their wounds. In other words, instead of always taking on the enemy, there are times when you have to run away from the enemy. Find a place where you can gather your strength. An intelligent warrior admits his or her weaknesses, and when you find that you're weak, you do what you can to make up for it. But at the same time, you don't take on more than you can handle. And John Lee talks about the lessons that come from living in a forest. And in his autobiography, he often talks about dealing with people. When people just got too much for him, he would go out in the forest to hide out for a while, to rest, recuperate, deal with his wounds. And so even when someone with that much strength of concentration, strength of mindfulness, he says he has to run away from it sometimes. He realizes, okay, we're not even anywhere near where he was. So we have to find places of rest, places of solace, where we can work on building our strengths. One of the lessons he learned, he said, in being in the forest was one day He and some monks and novices were going on alms, an alms round, and this wild hen saw the monks coming and made a squawk, and all her little chicks went running into a pile of leaves. So they knew the chicks were in the pile of leaves. So I had one of the novices go out and stir the pile of leaves around with a stick to see what happened if the chicks would run out, but they didn't. They all lay there very still. That was their protection. So sometimes our protection when issues in life get very difficult is we've got to find some stillness. So as you're sitting here and meditating, part of you may say, well, there are these issues I've got to deal with. But ask yourself, are you up to it? If you are, go ahead. If not, just stay there in the concentration. Concentration is a form of strength. It's a way of strengthening the mind. It's one of five ways the Buddha lists of strengthening the mind. One is to have conviction. One in the, the awakening of the Buddha, that it really did happen. He really did awaken, awaken through his own efforts. The message there being that he was a human being, he could do it. And even though he was a special human being, he said he wasn't using any qualities that other human beings didn't also have in a potential form. So we have the potential for awakening within us as well. We've got to hold on to that conviction. Whether it seems especially realistic right now in terms of where you are, the state of your mind. You can take comfort in the fact that you too have those potentials that you too can develop them through your actions, 
which is the second part of conviction, their actions really do make a difference. They're real. And the quality of your intention is what determines the results of the action that you're going to experience in terms of pleasure or pain. So the solution to whatever problem there is in life mean, starts primarily with looking at your own mind, admitting the fact that you may have acted in unskillful ways in the past, but you can also train the mind to be more skillful now and on into the future. And if you find that you're not ready for the other ways of strengthening the mind, you might want to sit around and just think about that for a while. Gain a sense of confidence that this is true, and that will energize you. That's the second way of strengthening the mind, is to develop persistence, just stick with something. And it doesn't mean just gritting your teeth and enduring. It means learning how, once you've determined what is a skillful course, how you can keep yourself on that course, what ways you can find of making it more attractive, more pleasant. So it's not just a matter of barreling through, because that kind of energy, that kind of persistence wears out pretty quickly. The Buddha made the analogy of playing a lute. You've got to figure out what level of strength you have. It's like tuning the main string on your lute so it's not too tight, it's not too loose. And then you, <clears throat> then you tune the other strings to that first one. In other words, the lo level of energy you have, that's the main determinant of what's too tight or too loose at any one time. So you figure out how much strength you have, and then you figure out how can I maintain that level of strength. This is one of the reasons why in the breath meditation we're taught to try to find as much ease and fullness and energy in the breath, because it's one of our allies for strengthening the mind. When the breath energy feels good in the body, the body gets stronger, and the mind dwelling in a comfortable place finds it easier to stick with the skillful path. And then there's mindfulness. What things can you keep in mind right now that are healing to the mind? Sometimes simply reflecting on the body. You start thinking about your feelings about this person or that person or this issue or that issue. Get you all riled up. We'll just say, okay, I'm sitting here with a body breathing. That's all I have to think about. That's the range of my awareness right now, being with a body in and of itself, and trying to make the sensation of being with a body as pleasant as possible. Just keep that in mind. This is what mindfulness means, is keeping something in mind. You keep the body in mind and put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. I mean, any world issues, you just put them aside right now. You don't have to go there. If you go there, Mara will get you. The Buddha talks about this being your ancestral ground, this being your safe place. You go out thinking about this issue or that issue outside. He makes a comparison with makes two comparisons. One is with a quail who wanders away from his safe place, i.e., a field where clods of dirt and rocks are all turned up by the plow, where he has hiding places. He leaves that and he goes out to a more exposed place where a hawk gets him. And as the hawk is carrying away, the little quail says, Oh gosh, this is my own lack of merit. I shouldn't have wandered away from my safe area. And the hawk, being piqued a little bit, says, Well, what is your safe area? The quail says, It's a field where the stones and the clods of earth have been turned up by the plow. So the hawk says, Okay, I'll let you go. You can go there if you want, but you're still not going to be able to escape me. 
And so the quail goes down and he gets on a rock and he says, okay, now come and get me, you hawk. And the hawk, without saying anything, folds his wings and dives down after the quail. And as soon as the quail sees the hawk is coming at me full, full tilt, goes hiding behind the rock. The hawk crashes against the rock, and that's the end of the hawk. In other words, see the body in and of itself as your safe place, where you can escape these issues that otherwise would overwhelm you. Just be very firm. I'm going to stay right here. Try to get as much ease and comfort out of the breath so I can maintain this state. But for the time being, I'm not going to go anywhere else. When you do this, you put the mind into concentration. For after all, the, what they call the foundations of mindfulness or the establishings of mindfulness, the four frames of reference, these are the themes of right concentration. You stay here consistently enough, it turns into concentration in the mind. And you can feed off that sense of ease and rapture that come with the concentration. That's your strength. That's your food for the mind. And the body gets nourished as well, because you let that sense of ease and rapture spread throughout the body. And this gives rise to discernment, the ability to look at those thoughts that were wounding and hurtful, issues in the outside world that have you all upset. And you can see them just as thoughts arising and passing away. And you have the choice. Do you want to go into that world or not? And if you feel obliged that you've got to go into that world, you ask yourself, well, why? Am I, am I ready for that world right now? Can I handle it? And after now, you just think, taking it apart. Okay, what thought leads you there? You can just take that thought apart. You don't have to think it. You're not obliged to think about these things. And if you're not ready to think about them, why burden the mind? Start questioning all the assumptions that would pull you out there, whether they're pride or whatever. Again, you remember you're a warrior, and a warrior cannot let his pride or her pride get in the way of the healing process. You want to look strong, you want to be strong, but hey, you're not strong right now, you're wounded. You've got to deal with your wounds first. And that's, and that's an intelligent warrior, a warrior who will come out winning in the end. The warrior knows that you've got to look after yourself. You can't, can't just go squandering your, your strengths, squandering your troops, and think that there's an infinite source of strength someplace. You realize your strength has its limits. I've told the story, I think, before of the Chinese martial arts master who taught his students his skills in martial arts. One day they were going to have a demonstration of their martial arts skills in a pavilion out in the forest. And the road to the pavilion, going through the forest, had a donkey on the side of the road. And this donkey was well known for being very obstreperous always in a bad mood, ready to kick anybody who came anywhere near. And so as some of the students were on their way to the pavilion, they said, here's a great chance for us to show off our skills as martial arts. We can deal with this monkey, uh, excuse me, deal with this donkey. And so the, the star martial arts student goes up first and, said that, and he takes one of his stances and the monkey just kicks him across the road. The number two student comes up and says, that's not how you do it. He tries a different stance, but he gets kicked across the road too. And to make a long story short, everybody gets kicked across the road. So they decide to wait. Well, how would, let's see how our master would do this. Maybe he's got a skill that he hasn't taught us yet. So they hide behind the bushes on the side of the road to watch. And finally, the master comes along. He sees the monkey, and he just walks way around the monkey. Doesn't get anywhere near. In other words, this is part of being an intelligent warrior. You know to choose your battles. 
which dangers to expose yourself to and which dangers to avoid. Number one lesson in Thai boxing is learning how to retreat, how to get out of a difficult situation. So as a good warrior, you have to know your strength. When you're ready to take on the battle, okay, take it on. If you're wounded or weak, yeah, hide out someplace and figure out how you can heal your wounds and build up your strength. That's the kind of warrior who comes out winning in the end. <laughs>